All right. Um, so uh, this is going to be mostly like just kind of uh, me sharing what I have discovered and learning about blockchains and, and what might be useful, might not be. Just trying to kind of be an, an advocate to the community. Um, maybe this stuff is worth adopting. Maybe there's value. Maybe there's not value. Um, and like, let's let's approach that in a in a structured way. Um, I also have a couple slides about my own project, but uh, that's that's not the majority of this uh, presentation. So, a lot of a lot of thinking about what a blockchain is has come from what blockchains have existed in the past, and I want to kind of g give you an understanding of what a blockchain can be because. It's not necessarily that which it has, has already existed. So, I mean, it's it's kind of like a legal entity. So, if, basically, if you can create a, a, a society or a um, association, you could technically do that with a blockchain, and then that would be something that anybody in the world could participate in. That might be useful for you. Um, and it's it, you know it uh, it can just go dormant because nobody's mining it. It goes away, but it can just come back to life. It doesn't. It doesn't go bankrupt, um, and it's predictable behavior, which uh, I'll get into that a little bit in the future as we go on. So, I also want to get into like the half truths and the myths because um, people think, oh well, it, 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 blockchains are this because this is what Bitcoin is, this is what Ethereum is. These are blockchains that have existed, and that's not limitations of the technology. So, like if you're thinking. I don't want to get involved in blockchain because it's libertarian and it uses lots of energy and it's it's greedy. Um, just remember that, like in the '90s, there were a lot of people saying, "I don't want to get involved in computers because it's nerdy." But that was a thing that, when you make that decision, you take a lot of power away from yourself because you're not able to influence the way that that technology progresses. Um, so mining, you know, people talk about, okay, it uses lots of energy, and it uses more energy than Switzerland. That's a, um, so why do we do it? Well, it, it gives you the ability to have anonymous um, distribution of some thing that is uh, egalitarian. So it's like a perpetual auction. You can take these things. And requiring sacrifice, you know, it, it, it creates this, this value for it. It's not the only way to distribute, but um, it's a way that, um, that, that works. It's easy. You could write it in code, and so that's, that's how things existed at that time. Um, so myth, this is a myth. It uses more energy than the financial system. No, the financial system uses more energy than anything else because it is backed by the military, and the military is the most energy consumptive thing that humans do. Um, so can you do so? Uh, can you do blockchain without mining? Uh, yes, there are things. There is research ongoing on this, and I'm, I'm really positive about the blockchain projects that are actually like in the uh, boots on the ground doing research. Um, we know how to how to secure a blockchain without miners. We don't know how to distribute fairly without miners. That's that's kind of where things are still falling down and. It's a research problem. It's ongoing. Um, politics. Blockchains are libertarian. They're, they're um, don't tread on my Bitcoin, don't take my, get off of my land. Um, this kind of exists because uh, early on, libertarians were the first people to discover this thing. And it was easy to do libertarian code. But that's evolving. Like there are new projects now that are moving in the direction of okay, we're going to address more needs. We're going to become more like a community currency, more like uh, an association. Um, so, blockchain and community networks. You know, let's let's face the beast and let's. Is there some possible benefit here? And if there is, let's understand it. Understand what's not a benefit and what the risks are. Um, so. On the benefit, this is this for me is the key thing. There is this money in the world, and basically there are people who want to give money to anything that can get them back their money plus 20%. But it's inaccessible to communities right now because 
the community's not able to prove to the capitalist that they can give the money back, and the capitalist is not able to prove to the community that they're not going to take over and subjugate that community. And by the way, um, I, this is a little bit of a, a digression. Um, you showed the, the video, uh, the picture early on about um, the, the Facebook uh, airplane thing, giving internet. I, this is mostly not a political talk, but I have one political statement to make here, is that those Facebook airplanes, those are going to exist, and they're not gonna be giving internet, they're gonna be giving Facebook net. And you know, there's uh, in, in Brazil, 100, bil 100 million people that are not connected to the internet. Somebody is going to connect them to something. And if that's Facebook net, you know, Facebook got on, uh, came into existence because of the internet. And the internet is a fair thing, which lets anybody, anybody can make a website and compete with Facebook. But if Facebook brings the Facebook net, then that Facebook net is going to be for Facebook. And that's going to lock them into a monopoly situation where you can never disrupt Facebook. There can be no Mastodon because it's going to be just Facebook. And that, that's my like one political statement in this, in this talk is that even though I, I value small things and I value local things, we have a problem that has to be solved. We have to get the rest, the other billion, uh, four, the other maybe what, four billion on the internet before Facebook gets them on the Facebook net. Um, and capital may be a way that we can do that. Um, so rules. Rules are the way that we can make the capitalist behave and that we can make, make sure that the capitalist is assured that the community will behave. Um, I was talking uh, earlier about, um, with, with uh, someone about um, this. Uh, the example was the GPL. The GPL is a system of rules which m require that IBM follows the rules and you follow the rules. And when you do that, you can collaborate with IBM on software. And it makes sure that everybody's following those rules. And so everybody gets to have something together. And uh, a blockchain can do that sort of thing. It doesn't mean that the ICO that you see online that has a flashy web page is going to do that. And, and I'll get to that later. But um, it is possible. So yeah, blockchains can impro impose these rules. Um, lower risk, cheaper money. Um, more investors, more, more people coming to invest into that community network because they know that they can get their money back plus 20% means that there's less risk of a takeover, a monopolization, because there isn't any one investor that's taken, that owns all of that community network. That's another, that's a, that's a possibility when you have rules. So um, this is something that if you, if you are out there saying, okay, I want to start a blockchain for my community network, I'm, I'm speaking to you. So this is a fragile statement, which, and I think it's a statement that a lot of blockchain people make. They think that, okay, everybody who made a failed ICO project, whatever, they were dishonest. They wanted to scam. And so because I'm honest, my project will work excellently. And I'm, I'm here to say, no, don't believe it. I think every project starts with the best intentions. And even if I'm wrong, it's a robust statement. It's robust because if you believe that every project that failed started with good intentions, then you will approach this from a perspective of solving, of uh, dealing with the risk. So risks. Um, and I, I've just kind of, I'm not going to name any names, I'm not going to gossip, but I've just looked at some projects that haven't gone so well in the past, and I've, I've identified a couple of risks. One of them I call the Gollum effect, which is they're trying to put together a system of incentives to control how their project will be used, and then those incentives take over them, and they start thinking about the money and, and collecting the coins and, and promoting, and they stop thinking about building anything. So, you know, it's like Gollum in the, the, the uh, Lord of the Rings, that he started out as one thing, and then that ring turned him into something else that wasn't what he wanted to be. Um, and the other one, I, I 
call it the alchemist's curse because alchemists had this belief that they could do this great thing, that they could turn lead to gold. And they thought that it would really work. And they told the king, yeah, I think I can do it. I just need some funding. funding." And the king was, you know, the king kind of made a dupe out of himself because he believed that he believed it because he wanted the gold. You know, it's easy to believe something when you want it to be true. And he wanted it to be true. So then this put the alchemist into a, a terrible position where he was trying and trying to make this, this gold, lead into gold and it ended up not working. And, and you know, it's, it's just a tragedy story. And I think that that is something that happens with a lot of these ICOs where they, they, they think they can do something and then they end up feeling under an expectation to deliver something huge on, on day one, and then their dream really pieces them apart. Um, and so ICOs, um, I am an anti-ICO person. And the reason is because basically ICOs are just doing it wrong. Uh, venture capitalists, I mean, I say venture capitalists are smart. What's that? Okay, okay, yeah, 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 um, thanks. Uh, so an ICO is basically, it stands for initial coin offering and they put up a big website and they say, okay, we're gonna do wonderful things, uh, buy our coin. And then there's a, then $100 million worth of, of capital of people believing in this coin just flow in to buy a coin for something that hasn't been done yet. And that's not how traditional investment works. Traditionally, they get a little bit of seed money, a little bit, like uh, a half million or a million. It's a lot, but it's not 100 million. And then they have to do something. They have to build a business. And then they get a Series A, 4 million. And then they have to turn the team and the product, they have to show a product and then they have to show a market for the product and then they have to show a working business and then they, they scale out and then when they do an IPO, which is a, um, you know, they go into the stock market, they've already got a, ver a successful business with revenue and all the things, and all that's working. Most startups fail along this process, and yet the ICO vision is that they're giving $100 million worth of capital to uh, a coin project, which often is nothing more than a white paper and a really nice website. And for me, that's, that's just bad business. It's just not the right way to do something. Um, so I, I made a slide of, you know, if, if you're thinking about getting involved in, in blockchain one way or another, how do you manage risk? Um, if you want to start a company, do it the traditional way. Go to traditional methods of getting your capital. And the reason to do that is because you're going to get business guidance and that guidance can't the value can't be overstated um ex impossible expectations you know resist becoming that alchemist that says i can solve all the problems of the world because that 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 promise is going to come back to you and haunt you um have incentives other than the blockchain that means if you're thinking about doing like a business do a business have a, a business with stock and with remuneration, with the, the, the things that businesses have been doing for the past 100 years. Um, and start off with the right community. Um, this is one that I just threw in. I, didn't, I, there's no, I have no evidence that this is important, but I feel like a blockchain project is a community project just like anything else. And if you start off with a community of people that just want to take for themselves, then that's going to reflect on how that, how that project turns out. And so in the interest of this, I wanted to do like four slides about my own project. Um, what you won't find, it's not an ICO. It doesn't have a flashy website. It doesn't make beautiful promises to change the world and these things. Um, basically, I, I decided to, uh, to take my old project, CJDNS, and to build a blockchain for it. Um, it's designed to facilitate uh, trading of bandwidth leases, and bandwidth leases is the way that I envision capital being able to flow into a community network. 
um, I built a, a bandwidth hard proof of work and an elected um, party that acts as a network steward and, uh, the, and, and gets some of the, the uh, coins from each mine. So bandwidth leases, um, I'm taking a, a strong position here. I believe that the access can be free as long as QoS priority is what we sell. And um, I, I think that if we make it a lease and trade system, that that can work. And uh, uh, yeah, flowing capital into projects. Um, and just a reputation system in case that, that uh, bandwidth is not delivered on. Um, the bandwidth hard proof of work is this idea that if miners are communicating with each other all the time, then they get a discount on how much work they have to do. And the messages that they need to send to each other can contain payload. They can contain some, some content of whatever you want. And so if you want to send a message out to the world to anyone who's interested, you can use this proof of work system to do that. And those messages will go out to all the miners and then the, the, all the pools will have copies of them. And so you can send like link state updates or market offers or tweets or these kinds of things. That's, that's anyway what I'm trying to do with it. Um, another trick that I used, I tried to use every trick I could in this, in this proof of work because you know work is where you really waste energy and I wanted to reuse, recapture as much as I could without compromising the security. So another trick I used was um, to, to reuse the encryption algorithms that are used in um, WireGuard and other projects so that any technology that's built to mine will be reusable to encrypt packets. Um, Let's see, oh, a limitation of this technology. It doesn't know the difference between bandwidth in a data center and bandwidth to the whole community because uh, blockchains are deaf and dumb and they don't know the difference. There are projects which are, are thinking about, um, you put up a, a, a wireless access point and you get some coins, but in order to do that, you really need somebody that signs a message saying, this is a real access point and not just something you made up on your computer. And I wanted to go the direction of everything is decentralized, every, everything is, you, you don't need that, that central authority signing that message. Uh, and the network steward, this is, this is the idea that basically 20% of each block is assigned to an elected key. And that key is, is someone who can uh, allocate money into communities, allocate money to, um, uh, to development of software, uh, that anything that will promote the network, that, that entity can assign that, can, uh, can use that money. So myself and one other person who are in the same company are uh, um, in that key and there are three other people who are contributors in CJDNS and Yagdrissel. So the initial network steward, it's a, a, it's a three of five multi-sig key. So uh, three people have to agree in order for uh, an expense to be paid. Um, and this is just to give you an idea, you know, if, if you're thinking, oh, well, can a blockchain be community oriented? Well, yes, it can. It can have some elected node that does these kinds of decisions. Um, our role will be to uh, create a roadmap for the project, pay some grants for open source software in the coin, um, investment into startups in the ecosystem maybe, and you know we're really focusing on legitimacy because we're an elected uh, node, so we can end up no longer having that position if we abuse it. Um, in my design, I made sure that there was nobody, no founder's fee, no pre-mine, no, no, nothing that gives any one person a, a authority over somebody else just on account of who they are. Um, so in, to recap, I don't want your money. Um, I'm, I didn't put up a website. I didn't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not making a you know, shiny thing. Um, I, I actually, if, if you want to get involved, I'm more interested in just people who want to fool around with the technology than people speculating. Um, I, I want to you know, relive the early days of Bitcoin when it was geeky kind of tech, um, not so much something for 
for speculators. Um, so if you want to get involved, that's my four slides on that project. And uh, just in conclusion, you know, my position is that blockchain's a tool. It's not a panacea. It's not a poison. Um, be careful of the projects that you get involved in because, you know, flashy websites can be dangerous. Um, the past 10 years have shown us some of the risks that we need to navigate. Um, and of all the possible uses for this, you know, is going to incentivize, uh, you know, payment for internet access. Really the big, big one is that you can get investment from outside to come in and pay for the installation of the infrastructure as long as that investment knows it's going to get its money back. And uh, that's all I got. Uh, you can ask questions both uh, about Philip and you can ask talk. Keep your All right. Mind and just in order to, to not to talk out, not to overlap voices, just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Um, I had one question for Caleb. So earlier you were. Do I need a do I need a microphone or something? No. Um, uh, earlier, you were saying about the research problems linked to blockchain, and there is one problem you did not mention, which is the problem of scaling. Mm -hmm. So, roughly speaking, the problem is that uh, in a blockchain, transactions are extremely expensive, and they become more expensive when the size of the network grows. And later you told us that you suggested using the blockchain as a broadcast mechanism for link state updates in the routing protocols. Yes. So do you know something that the, net, that the research community doesn't know? Okay. Um, it's two different things. So uh, I am not talking about putting link state updates in a blockchain. That is a bad idea. Um, so the, the, the packet crypt, my, my proof of work, which is all my code, um, the way that works is there, there are these messages that get spread around between miners. They don't go in the blockchain. The miner needs to prove that they had a certain number of them in memory at the time they mined the block, but they only have to provide four announcements at random. A four four of, out of the set that they claim to have, they provide a random four, and from, the, and, and from those, the, the community is able to deduce that uh, they had as many as they say they have. So that's the solution to that. On the point about blockchain scaling, um, I, I think that the problem is, is it's being solved, basically. I, I don't think that it's an un, unsolvable problem. I don't think it's a brick wall. In terms of community networks, economic factors are mainly solved, and the bigger issues are sort of legal and political. Uh, so that's very much a Eurocentric like view. Like that might be the case in Europe, where communities have money, they can you know put something forward. Uh, maybe are more technically uh, capable, uh, but then there's lots of regulation. In Africa, it's the opposite. People don't have money, they need the networks. But in some countries, there's almost no regulation. Um, so I guess my question is, um, taking those things into account, what is a sustainable economic model for community networks in Africa, in that kind of context? Yeah. So I guess, they con I mean, <laughs> Economics is a problem because there is no political will for these networks. When I said that the economics makes sense, this is that comparing to a private business selling uh, internet services, 
you could have a community network doing the same with less money and better quality. So uh, it's not an economic, I mean, the mathematics are correct. Now, uh, when you don't have at all <coughs> an economy and you depend only on external investments, it's a different problem. I mean, uh, I don't have a magic solution. Uh, but I would say that the money that are invested, for example, to connect uh, Africa could be used uh, around such models and not around uh, blockchain-based models. Because if you empower the communities to self-organize, you create the right conditions, they can make it without needing this type of extra incentives. I mean, for me, the only incentives that one uh, needs for sharing their internet access is just to secure their own bandwidth. If you technically, man as Freifunk tries to do, I mean, this is what I'm saying, is the, the what is my incentive to give you my excess bandwidth? It's not economic, this is what I want to say. If you, I secure my own bandwidth, I give it to you. And Freifunk is a very good example on how many people give away their bandwidth just because they feel uh, secure that their own usage is not threatened, for example. So I cannot answer all the problems of the world. I, I, it's, it's, it's comparative, my argument. It's that we don't need a, a solution that would enable a market. We don't need to get paid to share an internet access. This is my argument. Yes, but this could come through the political. I have a question. Do you have an, uh, an intuition I have in mind of how is this problem? Is there, do you have a specific example? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we're thinking that we can't grow that much because all the hardware comes from funding, that is research funding, basically. And there's no, like, we don't know what is a model to that is affordable for the community, like maybe a certain basic rate, um, but without requiring all that external funding to, say, um, to expand. Are users of your community network paying for their access? They Not the no? It's no. completely for free? Okay. Can you give us an idea about the income of the, key of the users you're aiming for? How much could, they, could people spare for them? I mean, at the moment, the, the choice of between how much food, I mean, between food and data. So at the moment, people are spending way more, higher percentages of their income on data than they, than they should because they're, they're literally choosing between food and data. I can't, I, there is a paper and I can get So since we know nothing about that, perhaps you could tell us how much does a cleaning lady earn? What would be a decent salary for a cleaning lady? So let's, so 200 rand a day. And what ab yeah. about the other obstacles that Hannes mentioned, but the fact that you also need, if you have people that are using the service, I mean service, there are people providing the technology, setting it up, who are in charge of, who is in charge of that? So at the moment there's a group of students and a group of people in charge. Um, then we've just started a co-op. There are a few people from the community, the community leaders, and a few people who are just interested in the technology who've been assisting and are now part of the board, shall we say, um, but are still very much needing outside uh, volition from, from the university. Just so both knowledge and administration and funding have, have come from out of the community that is being is using yeah, the service. Pretty much. I mean, we're doing training. I just want to say that the solution to this, this is my only argument, it's not a free market. First of all, this type of blockchain trading things are by nature uh, unbalanced. I mean, all the flow of money, whatever it is, will flow to a few people. I mean, there are few uh, uh, people that have internet access or popular locations. I would argue that you need investments to restructure the whole ecosystem to offer internet and not create a market because there are not money anyway. How people could buy and trade 
Bandwidth and on top have also the energy required extra energy that it's exponential as you mentioned uh, to maintain a blockchain. This is my argument. It's Wh not yeah. when you say investments, do you mean investment of money that is going back to the investor after that they get their money back, or do you mean funding like uh, state funding that just is yes. given a gift? St I'm not a politician, but yes, it's a structural funding, let's say. I mean, creating uh, processes, ecosystems that are local with experts that can build networks, uh, with, uh, I don't know, investment on infrastructure, I don't know, deals. So lo loan money or gift money? Investment doesn't have to be repaid with more capital. In your I don't imagine venture capital yeah. investing. Okay. I just have a question for uh, to be interested. Hear from the people who would say he does understand the technical implication of the word blockchain. Who, who does understand really what that means? Two hands were raised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bravo, bravo. Okay. A lot more was I was thinking because. Okay. I have a feeling there is a lot of mix-up from words. They are used in the mingling people which I know. They are here of cryptocurrency, and they hear of no blockchain. And I, if you ask, was it? What is it? Blockchain. You know. So uh, I think the clarification about this is. I'm a stamp, so people know. Who but feels the like they know more is, than they did at the beginning of the presentation? Yeah, well, if you didn't say anything about how blockchain is functioning very well in the technology, it's more how you use it. That was I thinking. But if they don't know, it's kind of ledger or database or whatever, whatever, whatever. You could use it for anything. That was just, I was curious. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I didn't understand uh, like how the investor gain money with uh, with this project. Uh, so the idea is that people would w you know you would make a Wi-Fi link to whatever um, you know you make a you make a connection to to another node your neighbor whatever and then that link is getting advertised with announcements that that exists and you're selling. You, you sell a tokenized quality of service guarantee on that link. So you're giving away free access, but you're selling the priority to somebody, and then they can, uh, somebody in Bahamas or whatever, can buy that right in that, that time period to the quality of service, and then you get the money from that, and then they turn around and they sell it to people who want fast connection. Any other questions? So what is that when we start uh, bandwidth hard means that um, as opposed to memory hard, it requires lots of memory or CPU hard, it requires lots of processor. Bandwidth hard is the idea that it requires lots of uh, traffic data between different CPUs that are mining at the same time. It's, uh, the, the parallelization requires communication. And it's the communication and the parallelization of these, which I could do also sequentially. You could do it without um, without communication. It's just harder. It's a trade-off. It's a it's a time so it's bandwidth trade-off. Right. Right. can change the rules of the games. Uh, basically, here it will drive people to um, build more and more and more bandwidth. Uh, but if people don't want it, how do they change the rules? Um, can you rephrase the question? For I'm instance, not sure here it will, it will push uh, some people to build more Wi-Fi access point, more yep. bandwidth, uh, more network capacity, but yep. if the community don't need that, if right. it's enough, right. and they want to resist that, right. how can they change the rules between, because it's dictated okay. by code through the network? Yeah, um, basic, I can give you the g generic answer, which is 
in a blockchain, basically the only way to change the rules is to contact everybody that has a node and say, okay, we'd like to update. Um, and Ethereum does this. Uh, they and they change rules, and, and Monero does it. A lot of the, uh, the the projects do it. Bitcoin doesn't do it because they're very they're very conservative about that. But it how are the rules decided? The developers talk to the community, and if people are willing to update, then it's it's a long and arduous consensus process. But um, I just want to give a shout out to uh, a really interesting project that's right in Paris called Tezos. Um, and they're actually working on something where you can change the consensus rules of the blockchain by voting. Well, uh, Panos, you mentioned the word colonialization. And I think I'm, I'm having the same opinion here that this is the risk that we're facing. You talked about the protections from that, right? Right. What is the essence? Can you can you repeat again the essence of? Yes, um, there's there's two there's two basic protections that I can identify right now. Um, one of them is if you have a protocol with a with a blockchain and the data is encrypted and it's going to a bunch of VPN exits, say, and you can choose your exit, right? Then it's hard for someone like Facebook to come in and say, oh. We want to make sure that we'll, we'll invest, but only if people can only go to Facebook because it's all encrypted. They don't know where the data is going. And that you, you, so you have some power at the protocol level to make that protocol free. The other aspect is that because you make it easy for investors to get involved, you, uh, you make it so that there's lots of investors. And because there's so many of them, it's really hard for one of them to monopolize that yeah, community. How do, you, how do you make sure that this is always possible to see when the monopolization happens? Um, so it would be obvious, right? Because they're going to try to change the rules. I mean, if they monopolize the network and they don't change anything, it doesn't matter. You know, they just happen to own all of it. But they're going to try to change some of the rules. They're going to say, well, you know, we would rather prioritize traffic that goes here instead of there. Would you guys all want to update the software to do this instead of that? And so you're going to be you're going to be privy to that. I mean, uh, the the, the Guifi project is having some issues right now where some people are trying to do different things, but they need to change the rules in order for that to happen. So it would give like power over the user, power from the operators of the network over the user, basically. Because they are the one who set up the network, and they, I guess, they somehow decide the rules or something like that. Um, the 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 person who writes the code really decides what the rules are going to be, and then the people that adopt that code kind of sign off on those rules. Because here you build like network capacity that's governed by code, yep. and it's the node who do the network capacity which adopt it. Yep. So users are powerless. Users have to adopt it as well. I mean, the user has to decide that they want to use that internet instead of the yeah, other internet. If, if you have like a network in place and it's the only network, mm -hmm. users don't have any power. They have to build their own network. That's different. So. But I mean, right now, your choices are SFR free. FFDN is a difference. Um, yes. So. I think that this is better because the rules are actually in code as opposed to the rules being according to the CEO of a company. Okay. I have a question for both of you. Uh, you said, Caleb, that your one political statement was that Facebook net uh, is going to happen uh, if we don't bring them internet uh, to the, those who are not connected now. Uh, and do you th both think that we need to connect everybody? And do you think that the the fact that Facebook net is going to happen isn't more uh, the risk isn't more in the fact that people are going to eventually like Facebook if we don't explain them and show them how something else could be better? Yes, no, I mean. All my life I talk against just connecting people and I'm even trying to be provocative to this community that it actually works for Facebook for free, no? You <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
Yes, I mean myself. I this is what I mean about colonialism. You know, bringing the internet uh, with parachute, like they were throwing food and things like that. I just want to say very quickly, it's not enough the good intentions. I mean, blockchain has an integrated speculation design even, and it's through the scalability problem. I mean, if you want to give incentives, you need to translate whatever tokens to real money, and as the network grows, the cost for maintaining it grows. So people naturally would need more money to maintain it. So this is a, an inherent speculation device that you don't know who can take advantage of it, and we know who takes advantage of it. And it's actually the way to extract value that it's implicit, not like Airbnb that charges a percentage of every transaction. But you have a project that distributes tokens, the early investors, then forever they will get, if the network is successful, they'll forever increase their profits because of this inherent uh, growth of cost that the network has. It's very complicated to understand, but it's exactly this type of extractive uh, model if you connect it to real currency. And this is one of the core design choices when you do alternative currencies, if they are transferable to the fiat currency. If you don't translate them to fiat currency, you have very limited incentives. And if you translate it, y the market can cannibalize whatever you had uh, uh, romantic in your mind about people sharing resources, etc. You cannot avoid it, even if you have good intentions. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Just because uh, I okay. I lost. Uh, do we really need right? Okay. To bring yep. the. 4 billion left yep. unconnected on the internet first. Yep. Yep. And uh, is it just a matter of who is going to be the first yep. Facebook net or internet? Right. Rather than showing the Facebook net is inherently not desirable and showing that something else yep. could be better. Gotcha. Um, so I think yes. I think that this is a, a major challenge of our time as to whether pe the next four billion are going to get on the the internet or whether they're going to get onto a captive portal that guides them to Facebook. And uh, I mean, to your point, this is probably like one of the fundamental disagreements between us. I think that you, we need to get people on the internet. I know they're going to go to Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account, um, and I I know that they're going to go to websites that I don't approve of, but. I'm, I'm going to accept that because the internet is something that anybody can participate in. It's, it's free to anyone, and it made Facebook, but it can take Facebook away. And what I am afraid of is that Facebook is going to use the model of, we'll give people access to something that's not the internet, and they're going to give people access to something that maintains their um, monopoly for perpetuity. But this assumes some sort of net neutrality, sorry to intervene, that does yep. not exist. I mean, Facebook does not play in fair terms uh, when somebody is connected to the internet. They have data centers close to the users, they are faster, they have uh, thousands of designers that make their products addictive. Uh, you cannot just stay, connect them to the internet and then they can choose. For me, it's a naive somehow approach. And Facebook does not only work with these basics, they are also satisfied if people are connected to the internet. I mean, they are doing their best, but this is already good enough for them. And Google also. Google does not have a, a basics program, but they are also fighting to connect everybody because this is their, uh, <laughs> how to call it? <laughs> oh, I think the internet can and should be more neutral, but I think that already the fact that you can set up your own website and compete with Facebook on the internet makes it very neutral. Compared to, imagine the TV, 20 years ago, you want to set up a TV channel? Forget it. The paperwork, it's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> so I have two questions from Pitch. Uh, first for Panos is, so, so uh, uh, your discrimination is between having uh, a currency that is convertible to fiat or not. So as long as the currency cannot be exchanged for real money, it could also use blockchain or whatever if it's technically feasible and useful. And, and, and the other question is, you know the, the, the Alpia project? 
and what are the main differences and if there are links of cooperation between you guys? So yes, this is one important parameter. Blockchain projects that are not connected to fiat are better, in my opinion, than those that are connected. But this does not make them uh, needed, because uh, then it's a question of scale. I mean, how big does it make sense to have a blockchain solution? Uh, and then we go to the other dimensions of building trust, engaging uh, local experts to secure the network, to run the network, instead of depending on an invisible uh, decentralized network. Uh, and this would be another discussion. Uh, my more strongest argument is for this type of blockchains that are connected to the fiat currencies and are speculative and they have this global perspective. When we go to the local, it needs more detailed discussion. How local? Why do we need it really? What, do we to, what problem we want to solve? Is this a real problem? I mean, then it needs paper, you know, to, to, to think when it's meaningful or not. I'm not against plug and play blockchain toolkits or something like that. But because of the very strong um, buzz and speculation, my impression is that all this get lost into these promises of big things. No, no, and but this is the point, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But uh, you seem to have an idea of blockchains that what you actually say that you see uh, an in inherent uh, speculative uh, article that is somehow embedded into the, the tool itself. And I, I do not agree with that. I agree with the fact that we have many blockchains for thin air. So we do not need blockchains for most of the time. But technologically speaking, there are a lot of alternatives that can make them more or less appealing. And I do not see this, you know, um, bad image of the technology itself because it brings with itself speculation automatically. For instance, even the, the, the Amber guys at the beginning, I don't know if they're still doing it, but they wanted to use proof of elapse of time, which doesn't mine, doesn't consume energy, it's, it's just another kind of proof. And I, I mean, I don't know if they ever will ever do it or what, but if you remove the proof of work, and so the amount of energy that you have to, and the competition that is based on how much power you can achieve, then you're already taking out a huge part of the problem. No, as I said, it's a more detailed discussion, and uh, it's the question if we all need to focus on this technical problem or on the policy, social uh, regulation. I mean, this is my argument, that maybe it's interesting uh, from an engineering perspective, maybe it could be not so bad, but it's not the biggest problem that we have. If I may, I think that you, Panos, you place in community networks, you really stress community first. <laughs> yeah. That's a um, no, uh, you, you had asked a question of me about Althea Project, and um, I really want to answer it because those are awesome guys, uh, awesome people. Um, what they're doing is basically, so they, they dodged all the problems, the Gollum effect, the, the, uh, they, they didn't do an ICO, and that saved them immensely because they could be boots on the ground putting wireless connections, making things happen because they just said, all right, we're just going to use Ethereum. Fixed. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, what they're doing, they set up a node. The node, um, the, so they have nodes that are um, access points to the internet. And then if, if you connect to one of those, you pay uh, a, a couple Ethereum pennies every whatever to send and receive traffic to them. And if somebody connects to you, they pay a couple penny things, whatever, in order to send and receive traffic to you. Um, it's the authorized internet access node that is the anchor point that everybody builds a tree out of and everybody pays the, toward that node. Um, my vision is th that, that, that works really well and they're doing stuff and I have nothing but uh, praise for them and what they're able to do and we're, we're pretty friendly terms. Um, my vision is that you will take a, a, a connection between two points and then you'll sell the QoS downstream because that allows external speculation to be converted into investment and the investment is what makes the network build out and then it gets its money back later. 
So just one technical thing, like well, what is the advantage of taking the blockchain inside the network rather than using any other uh, Ethereum as uh, Athea does? Um, network steward? Technically speaking. Network steward. Uh, it's not technical, but there's a network steward, you know, and so some of that uh, when if when there is speculation on the coin, some of that money goes back around and back into the, that community. And another one is the um, packet crypt is uh, it's not only a mining algorithm, but it's also a broadcast system. So you can broadcast link state net, uh, information through the miners. First, I agree that LP is ridiculous. And uh, so I just wanted to make a quick comment to Panos. Uh, I share your concern about what you call Facebook Net, which is a pretty good name. I entirely share your concern. You said that. You said that? Yeah, yeah that's, that's my sorry. concern. <laughs> so okay. I have a quick comment for Caleb, which is that I entirely share your concern. And at the same time, I cannot help thinking that, we're, that when it happens, we will have a lot of fun writing software to provide unlimited internet access over to Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be real fun. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I, I want to also say that for a person who has no access to any means of communication, if Facebook is the one that comes in and gives them the ability to communicate with their family members, as much as I don't like Facebook, I'm going to sit on my hands and say, okay, you solved the problem, not me, and I'm not going to hate you. And we're going to do IPv6 over Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. But um, I, I want to I solve that problem. I want to solve the problem first. Uh, when you look at uh, FFDN and ISP like that, you have like a uh, human that does it. So then it respect the value of the human that are in it, and the, uh, this is what incentivizes people to do things and so on. Mm -hmm. So here you, uh, the incentive is money. How do you ensure that the, there is some like va common values between people and that they don't go only for the money and mm -hmm. that's not lost? So if you have a community network and it works, like if it's working now, don't mess with it. I don't want you to bring blockchain into a community network that's working really well. Um, like, because th these things are too beautiful to mess up. And the only, the only time, I, I just want this for the, the other four billion that don't have any access or when they set up some, some like couple of radios, then people are just taking and they're not giving back. There's one person that's a single point of failure and that person's volunteering. Like, I, you know, I, I think that these things can live together and it's going to be a decision of each community individually. Like, is this something that we want to use or not? And if it's not, I support you fully because you're doing mesh and that's what's important. And in fact, there is a point that blockchain as a technology addresses it, but it's uh, given more advantages to the early adopters. And yep. the fact that you said uh, about uh, one single point uh, of failure, in fact, this is an incentive. Blockchain brings this kind of incentive of multiplying this, which is, in fact, having to multiply and to spread out a, a problem for community networks. So. Can, you, can you give me a little bit more, like an example or something? I'm not fully... Well, um... um it takes a lot of human cost right. to set up a network. Right. And uh, the benefit is seeing that people are happy with it, and mm -hmm. knowing that you are, have allowed some other people to, to use the internet to communicate, yeah. and, uh, uh, which is good, right. still kind of fragile. Right. So, indeed, blockchain might, as a technology, bring some more incentive Incent yeah. to okay. this kind of problem and yep. solving this kind of problem. And then the fact is, should we use technology to solve this kind of human problem mm -hmm. or not? This, that is another question. So I like to think of, um, there's sort of these two layers where you have like the hard incentives. We all have money in our pockets for the most part and we all, we all go to work and we all have a bank account and we pay for things. And then 
on, on top of that layer, we have the layer of the human connections where we all work together toward common goals. I like to solve as much as possible in that bottom layer so that we don't stress our, our human connections with each other so that everybody has their, their needs taken care of by a very mechanical system of money and, and these things so that we don't have to lean on each other and then because I feel like it can, it can build, it can make that, the, that uh, the social connections that much tighter because we're not leaning on them to solve basic needs. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, if 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 you're talking about the coin itself, then I mean it's like every other coin. That if people get it early, then that's going to have that effect. Um, if you're talking about just creating a big bandwidth and then selling that, or or buying up bandwidth in all the different community networks or something. Uh, and then holding that bandwidth and then running the price up and then uh, and then only metering it out a little bit. The risk is if you do that, that people are going to install more hardware. They're going to take the money that the, they, they got from you buying up all that bandwidth that they put on the market and they're going to install more hardware and put more bandwidth on the market. And so you're really not going to win doing that. Um, now on Sybil attacks, it's... This system is not really attackable in that way. Uh, if you look at like Helium, um, I shouldn't really talk about what they're doing because I don't know it in super detail. But what I know is that they are using something with GPS. And that kind of stuff is a little bit hairy because you, know, you can tell a blockchain anything. And it has no way to verify that you're telling it the truth. So the way this works is this is all about bandwidth between CPUs. So you're mining on two CPUs and you need to send messages between them. So yes, you could move all those CPUs into one data center. That's, that's the downside of this. But the upside is that you don't have to check that it's not doing something. Does that answer your question? That's sort of, I guess I'll have to look. Yeah, OK. Is that- since we're talking about mesh, this is a mesh conference, and you said mesh networks are, are great and so on. When you talked about Althea, um, you, you, you brought up the topic that they have nodes which connect to the internet, and people build trees on those with the goal of connecting to the internet. Right. With your project, it sounds like, I mean, if I'm saying it right, you are uh, allocating, uh, or whatever the right word is, QoS between nodes, and so you could make a mesh network. But how do you, I, I guess, how do you see the the coin, money, transactions, etc., flowing when you're communicating between nodes in that network, not to the internet. You know, it's not someone who's opening a gateway. Right. It's like A talks to B, and then later A talks to C, and then later C talks to B. So... Can I make just a quick intervention? Yeah. Althea is not streamlined. Uh, I'm just going on with Yeah, it's actually, okay. that was a simplification for it's okay. for good reason. But, but they, they are okay. selling access to the internet. That's yeah, it's basically access to the internet. That's a. That's the point. Um, yeah, so you don't. Uh, my vision is that like people want the internet. That's that's just the reality. Let's encrypt as much as we can. That's why I want to use CJDNS so that um, because to the point of uh, network neutrality, when it's not encrypted, then you have people saying, "Oh, I like this. I don't like that." Um, so let's encrypt everything. Forced encryption. Um, and then, yes, you can use it to communicate with other people in the mesh. You can use it to communicate exit out to the internet through a VPN exit. Um, and uh, you're asking, what happens when you just want to communicate with somebody next to you? Well, it's not metering the way that, um, the way that uh, Althea is. It's, this is not a metering model. This is a model where somebody has a QoS write on this this link, and if the link is is overloaded, you just ask. You're going to ask somebody who's running a um, basically a mesh access provider, and there'll be lots of these. They somebody can run one anywhere that they want. Um, 
it will be, you'll, you'll have to ask them, they'll probably be in a data center, they'll probably be on the internet. You'll just be asking them, can I get access to this network? And then, then they'll grant you the routes to everything that you want to reach. So, so would you say that this project's concept, goal, and et cetera, is more about uh, getting you to the right destination cleanly, likely across the internet, rather than making a physical topology on, on the air? If you want to connect over the mesh network and you don't want to use the internet, that's totally doable. Sure, sure, the, um, the mesh network that's virtually on top of the internet, right? No, no, no. I'm, I want to do wireless mesh networking and getting people who don't have internet connections onto the internet and the mesh. Okay, yeah, we, um, we are going to take a short break of 10 minutes before... Uh, Starting with uh, Habit's talk about uh, cellular um, uh, technology and communication uh, with TKAC. In 10 minutes, we're going to start.